We are the nowhere generation. We are the kids that no one wants. Oh. The man with one of the most recognizable voices in the music industry joins me now to have a chat about their forthcoming album, Nowhere Generation. It's Tim McElrath from Rise Against. Welcome. How we doing? Mate, pretty bloody good, but how about you? Like, you are on the verge of having one of the most important albums of 2021 being released. How's uh, everything going in Rise Against Camp? Are you just keen as fuck to get this album out? Yeah, absolutely. We're just kind of chomping at the bit, you know? It's been, like, a long time. These songs feel like, uh, they feel like secrets that you've been holding in, like you couldn't tell your friends about, you know? And now, like, we can finally let them out, you know, and talk about it and play them and... It just feels really good. And what we've seen so far, these songs uh, represent obviously the most fucked up year we had in 2020, but it's also been a combination of things that have been picking up over the past couple of years. It's not exactly like based upon what happened last year, but more so what led up to that. Yeah, and in that way, like I think Rise Against has always been on the, the dystopian edge of music. You know, we've always been singing about things that are happening in our world and then painting a picture of what the world might look like if you keep going down that road you know and so even though the bulk of this album was actually written in like a pre-pandemic world i think people will find that the songs and the lyrics are talking about um what last year really looked like and i think that the reason that is because we always are trying to like um paint that picture you know and then i don't think any of us thought it would come true that soon (laughs) yeah exactly i mean you you know it it essentially has become the soundtrack for that year of our lives we lost exactly i i I remember somebody using the term uh accelerating existing trends and they were talking about technology and all the different technology that we use like this this right here you know to us you and i talking on this uh whole format you know what we weren't doing a few years ago and we've accelerated existing trends of technology but we've accelerated existing trends of just like society like geopolitics you know the things we're talking about the institutions that we are propped up by or corralled into that keep civil society going you know we're talking about racism and we're talking about sexism and we're talking about um poverty we're talking about concentrated wealth the rise of the one percent a lot of these things that like you said were already happening um but the pandemic really brought them to the forefront and change the conversation a little bit. It really gave us time to sit back and, you know, think about what's important to us. And then, like, we've got to watch the world on a global scale. I mean, here in Australia, things are slowly but surely returning to normal. But you take a look at what's happened with America, and it's only just starting to get to those moments where vaccinations are getting rolled out. There's going to be a kind of return to normal at some point. I mean, and you've also just got rid of the Trump administration, which, you know, must be a massive weight off all of your shoulders. Yeah, Donald was kind of like air pollution. <laughs> like you're just <laughs> always there, always present. Like you're always hearing his voice on the radio, or TV, or something like that. And so that it was, it was so great to see America reject not just Donald, but that whole ideology, that whole way of thinking. Because Donald is just kind of like a a symptom of a of a bigger disease. Like every there's a Donald in every country around the world. You know that that ideology hasn't gone anywhere. Um, and in writing this record, I didn't want to write a record about Trump. That would have been really easy to do, especially being in Rise Against. You know, like, here we are, a political punk band during the Trump administration. It would have been a lot of low-hanging fruit and easy targets to sing about. Mm. But I think that, you know, putting Nowhere Generation together, like, I was like, let's sing about some of the things that are happening under the surface and some of the things that allow someone like Trump to rise to power. And let's yeah. talk about the world that that someone would live in to make a choice like that or to help someone like that get ahead. And the thing that you've uh, obviously put into this record as well, too, is you're creating an anthem for people like us. And uh, the, the movement of like people that are in power are in power is, you know, something that's slowly but surely becoming an outdated thing. Because when everyone bends together for the same uh, cause, you know, we can make change. And a perfect example of this is the Black Lives Matter movement, which not only kicked off in America after the tragic passing of George Floyd, but it kicked off in Australia. It kicked off in the UK everywhere. So many people got together on this to highlight that issue. 
Now, uh, when I talk about Rise Against Two Mates, I mention the fact that you guys have been a political band from the very start of your career, so all the way back in 1999 to where you are now. And it's incredible to see the progression over the years, but the fact that you haven't strayed away from your determination to get these points across through your music. And like a fine wine, you've got better with age and we've truly appreciated and grown with the band and the uh, topics that you've covered over the years. So it's a testament to you and the boys of how far you've come from and the fact that you're still sticking to what's important. Well, I could I could sit here all day and listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> I've got plenty but, more to talk about at the end. So uh, yeah, take that in first. <laughs> It's, it's, we feel very lucky to be here, and, and I think that the world has always created uh, our audience for us. You know, the world has created a tumultuous place um, where people are looking for music that reflects a lot of the questions they have about the future. And I think that's kind of where where we fit in. And so to be able to be doing this, to still be doing it, and to be still connecting with people, and not just like here, but like globally, you know, that's like that that that's a really like we feel very grateful for that and you guys aren't just putting out music and then moving on to the next album so to say or you know touring around and doing an album cycle you're putting out music you're talking about those issues and you're following through you're going to the protest you're getting the word out there and the right information to the fans so they can not only make up their own minds but do their own research on what you're talking about and i think that's a very important thing to do especially with a band with a platform like you guys and i think that you know you take a look at some of the political bands that come to mind anti-flag fever 333 you know you guys are using your platforms for the benefit of good and there's a lot of other bands out there who should probably either follow suit or you know see what you're doing and not just create music that you can headbang to but music that creates movement and gets people talking yeah it's and because not everyone has access to something like like a vehicle like this you know and so when we look at rise against especially coming from the punk and hardcore world you look at this really incredible dynamic vehicle to get ideas and a message to people who are listening you know and like how lucky are we to have that vehicle and like not everybody like you said um decides to use that for what we use it for and i don't really condemn bands for not being political i don't think that i don't think the ramones needed to be political you know i don't think that but i think the, that the clash was was really impressive you know and they really um changed a lot of conversations and so we just kind of follow our gut and and also like i don't i don't have like rock star dreams like i didn't get into this because i wanted to be like a rock star like what excites me is being able to kind of turn light bulbs on over your head like that's what i get out of it you know that's that's like what that's how i know we're doing a good job is if we're turning on some light bulbs or if we're like ruffling some feathers and creating some friction you know that's like what keeps me coming back for more. And that's exactly what you guys are doing best. Uh, we're going to wrap up with a bunch of fan questions that really dive into what you guys do best at the end of the interview. But first, I wanted to talk about the fact that you guys got a song, Broken Dreams Incorporated, in the DC Dark Knights uh, heavy metal soundtrack. Like, you got, you're making the jump from music to multimedia and comics. Like, how is it getting an invitation to be part of something special like that? Oh, it was really, it was really exciting. And at the same time, it was like, uh, when I started talking about it, I was trying to figure out, cause I'm not like, a, I, I, I'd be a poser if I told you I was deep into comics and, and the graphic novels and that whole world. Like, um, I, 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 I grew up collecting comics and that kind of thing, but I've strayed far from it. And so when I was talking about it, I, I felt like, uh, ill-equipped to like talk about the Dark Knight series and DC comics. Yeah. But as I got to know the writers and the illustrators and the, and the soundtrack people, it struck me like, oh yeah, we're all storytellers. Like you're telling your story with a pencil and I'm telling my story with a guitar, mm. but we're all trying to like communicate to our fans and our community and comics and graphic novels. They're always wrestling with like issues of justice, you know, issues of, personal turmoil and triumph and overcoming something like they're all communicating they're using the story to communicate these things and i realized that we have a lot in common actually like i had a lot in common with those writers who are creating these stories and we were all reaching people in our own in our own way in your own special way exactly and it's mm -hmm. not like you uh got bitten by a radioactive spider and that gave you the power to write some amazing songs hey <laughs> 
Not yet. No. <laughs> There's still time. Uh, yeah. Now, with this album itself on the way, you can pick yourself up a copy on June 4. Make sure you stream it. It's fucking amazing, to be honest with you. It's got something that incorporates every single thing from the Rise Against uh, back catalogs all the way through into now. You got the ballads, you got the hardcore punk songs, you got the rock songs, the mainstream radio rock songs. I mean, you're really dabbling in a whole bunch of different genres. Is that a way to sort of appeal to a wider audience and get different messages across? Or did it just come across naturally in the studio to write the songs as they turned out? Yeah, I wish I could tell you we were that organized and strategic. <laughs> <laughs> but we never we never have been. We've never gone into an album with a blueprint or a, a grand plan or a PowerPoint presentation, you know, a dry erase board with, here's what we're going to do, you know. <laughs> we just kind of, we just spew out songs and some of them are good and some of them aren't. And then we find the good ones and we put them on a record. And I just write, you know, just to write and just put these ideas together. And only when we step back from the whole thing and get a little perspective, we're like, oh, I think we were doing this. You know, I think this is what we were going for. This, or this is what needed to happen. Or these were the itches we were scratching, you know, and then the big picture comes together. And then the album and the theme, and the title and everything comes together. And then it, it's just, it's a very like kind of organic process. And luckily it's always happened for us. You know what I mean? Like luckily when you step back, it's like, oh, this actually looks like we thought about this <laughs> you know but in but it really was just kind of just this you know exertion of, of effort and creativity i mean you guys have been doing this for 22 years this is your ninth studio album so you would expect that you know by this point in time you jump in the studio and you're not going to sit there and go i'm having a brain fart i don't know what to do yeah i mean the hardest thing to do when you write your ninth album is just not trying not to go down roads you've already been down you know yeah try not to like tick the same boxes you've already ticked. And I think inevitably we're probably going to do that, or I'm sure you could probably make a credible accusation that we do do that sometimes, but we're, we're just trying to like, you know, create something new and like different and not relying on like old tricks, you know, or things that have kind of gotten us out of problem parts of songs or whatever. And then create something that like, that feels new and not just a, a regurgitation or a hodgepodge of, of some weed, something we did in the past. Yeah, copying what you've done in the past and just doing control C, control V, essentially for a new album. Right, exactly. Yeah, and they, and it's it's difficult. And there's not we don't I, don't, I try not to overthink about it, I, or I try not to overthink it. But um, you know, you don't want to. I feel like it's just as disingenuous to like try to write songs that sound like your former self as it is to try to write songs to like get on the radio. You know, they both yeah, yeah, have their yeah. own. They both lack authenticity. You know, like they both are you trying to be something you're not like all you can do is just write something like about where you are authentically like in that moment. And the thing is, with what you guys put out, like every time you hear a Rise Against song and you hear your voice, Tim, you instantly recognize that it's a Rise Against song. And this is something I've spoken to fans and, and, and you know, people who have flown through in and out of your back catalogs. Like the minute you hear your voice, you know what you're in for. You know this is Rise Against. And I think that's something so special that not a lot of bands can actually pull off. But you yourself have been able to do this. So, you know, testament to you and, 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 and all the boys for what you've done. Yeah, it really is like a process that like, it always surprises me too. Like, I think of our band as almost like an assembly line. Like I might bring in something or Joe might bring in something and we might look at it and be like, how is this going to be Rise Against? Mm. Like, how is this going to get to Rise Against? Isn't this crazy? And by the time it goes through the assembly line and, and Joe gets his hands on it and Zach gets his hands on it and Brandon gets his hands on it, it comes out and it's like, it's Rise Against. And that's just something that's sort of, that's the chemistry and the magic and, and, and why we are a band that anybody talks about. It's perfect. When you guys get into the studio, you make love musically. And then the end result are these amazing albums that we love and adore. Yeah, I guess you're right. That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> All right. Well, we need to head to the, the fan zone. Now, one thing I wanted to mention with this is uh, you are the voice of the voiceless. You are the band that fans love and adore and appreciate because they relate to your music so much and they have this full-on connection, which it's it's hard to come across in many bands. You know, for example, take a look at this. This is from your uh, download festival appearance, photo by Mitch Chamberlain. The thing is, I put a call out to a bunch of Rise Against fans to see if we could get them to, you know, ask a couple of questions that they've always been wanting to know. And 
the, the, the personalities and the, and the personalness of these questions is insane. So with your permission, I want to go through a bunch of these because you really do need to hear what your fans have to ask and say of you. Uh, yeah, of course. All right, so the first one comes from Nat. He wanted to say that this song in particular is a song that's saved him quite a few times over the years since it got released. He went to say, uh, when you wrote Survive, what was your inspiration behind it and what did it mean to you at the time? Oh, wow. I wrote, I wrote Survive like in the attic of my first house with like a, a sleeping baby down below. Try not to be too loud. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the lyrics just kind of poured out of me. And I think that Rise Against already had a, um, two records under our belt at that point. And I was, it was, what did you say this person's name was? Nat, yeah. So like, it was stories like, stories like that. Like it was touring on the Unraveling and Revolutions Per Minute and having people share with me what they were going through and what the song means to them. And like, I was new to the idea of like singing for a band, of being a guy in a band and being lucky enough to, for someone to deem me worthy of hearing their story, you know? And they were all swimming in my head, you know? And it was really cool because it was this, like, I got this window to people's lives. Mm. And like, and and sometimes the songs meant things to them, them that I didn't even anticipate or they were going through something I didn't, I didn't really understand, but, but, but it helped them through it. And so, yeah, that's what I was really thinking about was like finding this amazing rise against community of fans, hearing their stories, and I couldn't help but being affected by them. And I think that because everybody was a survivor, everybody was like really overcoming these things. If I, if you were talking to me about it, like you overcame it, you know? Yeah. And that was, I found that inspiring. I think that's where Survive came from. And you look, I mean, that song was released back in 2006 and it's still helping Nat and other people to this day. So, you know, it goes down uh, as one of your your songs that people relate to the most and they can turn to any time, no matter how long, it got, how, how many years go by. Exactly. And that song, I think of specifically as a, as a song that the fans latched onto and they made it popular. Like we have like radio singles that like, there's like people that push it to radio and we try to get you to hear them. And like, you know, they're promoted and that kind of, we make a, we make a music video. And then there are deep cuts on albums, you know, that don't get a video and they don't get on the radio and everything. And that song, the fans deemed it important, you know, and we yeah. play it almost every single show we play, even though it was never a single. It was just became this like it, it's a really rewarding song to have and to play because it really is something that the fans decided okay we don't care what you're playing on the radio we want this song this we one, love this yeah. one and that's really yeah. validating all right now we're going to move on to crothers he wanted to say uh firstly how much uh he wanted to express how much time and tragedy meant to him um at the time, he was going through hell and he couldn't talk to his family or his friends about what was going on. So when that song came out, he sat in his driveway, listened to it for the first time and broke down crying because for the first time in his life, he felt like the only four people that understood what he was going through was Rise Against, his favourite band. So he wanted to, first of all, give you credit for that and say thank you for helping him through that moment. And then he wanted to go on and say that Rise Against has been at the forefront for social issues since the start of your career. Like you seem to jump on something and then uh, a couple of days, weeks later, it becomes a massive big issue. So what's the motivation and drive behind you guys to be the first to talk about these issues before they become uh, widespread? You know, I grew up in like the Chicago punk and hardcore community in like the mid 90s. And the first time I heard like, the word sweatshop was at a punk show. Like the first time I learned about environmental issues like global warming was at a punk show. The first time I really heard about the plight of indigenous cultures was like at a punk show. The punk show became like my secondary education, you know, animal rights, um, everything, you know? And so I knew that like, if I ever had the microphone, if someone ever gave me the opportunity to be on that stage. Like I wanted to pass that torch to like whoever the next version of me was in that crowd, kind of like being like a, a, a sponge for all this in, like life changing information. And so um, I like to think of Rise Against as just a, a continuation of that vehicle. 
Beautiful, mate. And we are going to see the continuation of the band with the new album, No Air Generation. It is out June 4th through Loma Vista Recordings. Tim, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for stopping by Wall of Sound. Hey, the pleasure is mine. We miss uh, Australia. We miss our Australian fans. Um, we can't wait to get back down there. Wall of Sound!